Office of State Representative uh, for District 29. We welcome the, the women, League of Women Voters. They are a well-known group who are nonpartisan, as well as help with a lot of election processes. You know, the democratic process, uh, one of the most important parts of that is that we select people who represent us in government. And this is an important election coming up for all of us, including Pontiac, because we have had a great ally in our prior state representatives in uh, Lansing to carry forth the agenda of Pontiac. So this is a chance for voters to exercise your right uh, to choose your representation. And we're so happy that the League of Women Voters has made this process interactive, where the audience will have a chance to ask questions to determine these issues and the views of the various candidates who are here before you this evening. We are happy to host this here in our city council chambers. Uh, for everyone to know, this forum uh, this evening is being live streamed as well as taped for our cable broadcast. So I do welcome you. Thank you, Judy Bateman, and the volunteers that you have brought. And we welcome the League of Women Voters for the candidate forum this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome to this candidate forum. Today is June 27, 2018. This forum will be featuring the candidates who have filed for State Representative 29th District, which includes Pontiac, Auburn Hills, Orchard Lake, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and a little bit of West Bloomfield. This is a two-year term. Sponsors of this forum are the League of Women Voters, Oakland County. I am Judy Bateman, a member of the League of Women Voters. I am not a resident of this district. The League of Women Voters is a trusted national nonpartisan political organization. Our members do the hands-on work to safeguard democracy. While we never endorse a candidate, we are directly involved in shaping the important issues that keep our community strong. As a League of Women Voters member, I have the opportunity to contribute in a leadership role such as this that has great impact on local, state, and even national issues. If you are interested in learning about how you can make a similar impact, I would encourage you to pick up some of our information out on the table that's available here tonight. Or check out our website at lwvoa.org. Again, the League of Women Voters does not endorse any candidate or political party. Views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and the sponsors take no responsibility. The format for this e event has been established by the League. We ask that the candidates, that the audience remain silent during the forum. Please turn off all cell phones. We ask that candidates answer the questions with their views only and not interrupt another candidate. The candidates will be answering questions submitted by the audience and screened for duplication by Bethany Willett. Uh, we have pages who are walking around with cards and pencils. If you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. Or if you want them to pick up your card, just raise your hand. Ch uh, Charles Carpenter and Jerry Rinchler are our pages. The format is as follows. All candidates will be given one minute for opening statement in alphabetical order. Closing statements will be one minute in reverse order. Candidates will have one minute to answer each question in rotation unless extended by the moderator. The candidates are Kone Bowman, Democrat, Brenda Carter, Democrat, Mike Demand, Democrat, Chris Jackson, Democrat, Kayon Payton, Democrat, Kermit Williams, Democrat. Also on the ballot, but not here tonight, is Timothy uh, Carrier, who is <laughs> the only Republican on the ballot. We have extra water. <laughs> okay. We will now begin opening statements with Mr. Bowman. Good evening. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for actually having this and allowing us the opportunity to come before the citizens of District 29 uh, for this live stream as well for the citizens of Pontiac. Uh, my name is Kone Bowman. I am a resident of the city of Pontiac, Michigan. I am currently uh, working as a computer programmer and a robotics programmer for a company as Kawa Monoman, uh, located in Rochester, Michigan. I'm a small business owner here in the city of Pontiac where I own a boutique insurance agency which I've run for the past 23 years. I'm a former city council member for eight years, a Lighthouse of Oakland County uh, Development Board council member for four years, a uh, member of the Lighthouse of Oakland County Investment Board uh, for the last four years, a former member of the Pontiac Pension Board where we actually ran a five, excuse me, a $500 million pension fund. Uh, for the past 12 years where I was co-chair. Um, 
my time is up, so I thank you. Let me just remind you that she'll hold up 15 seconds when you have 15 seconds left and then okay. stop. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Carter. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. My name is Brenda Carter. I'm currently the president of the Pontiac School District Board of Education. I'm also the immediate past president of the Michigan Association of School Board. I currently hold the position of secretary treasurer on the Tax Increment Finance Authority as well as the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority for the city of Pontiac. I'm the former interim assistant city manager for a local city here, um, and I'm also uh, the MPLP graduate, which is a fellowship, a year-long fellowship that prepare um, elected officials for higher offices. Um, basically, I'm here today to run because I have uh, deep concerns about our educational system, as well as our infrastructure system, as well as uh, economic and community development, all of which I'm very strong in. So I hope I have your support. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters, too, for having this forum. Thank you. Mr. DeMand. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. And thank you again to the uh, League of Women Voters for inviting me here today. I am uh, most recently a uh, community affairs professional working in the public sector for uh, the Detroit Tigers, where I had the opportunity to sort of start living a dream, which is for not very much money, you do reach out and you work with different organizations and different groups who are, are, are underserved and they feel that they're left out of the system, and we brought to them a message of involvement and collaboration, and that included even in the city of Pontiac working with Haven um, for, with their families over there. Um, also, I've spent time working in other city government agencies under people who have uh, professional backgrounds, smart people, PhDs, master degrees, and what I saw is there's a huge problem that we're starting to build over a broken structure as opposed to tearing it down and building it right from the bottom up and that's what I'm running for thank you thank you mr. Jackson good evening and uh, thank you to the women League of voters uh, as well as the city for allowing us to have this forum today my name is Chris Jackson I'm running to become your next state representative uh, my background is in project management uh, as well as entrepreneurship and small business uh, more recently I am on the board for identify your dream organization which deals with uh, grieving children who have lost loved ones. I'm on the board for Main Street Pontiac, which is essentially a downtown business association now for the city of Pontiac. Uh, I work for a company called Accent Pontiac, where I am their community liaison, and uh, we provide in-school, after-school music programming uh, for children um, that otherwise may not have access to that outlet, and I have an opportunity to mentor kids uh, on a pretty regular basis at school, uh, as well as working with the Youth Recreational Committee and the Youth Advisory Council where we allow kids to govern themselves uh, and learn government. And I'm running because we need results and I'm a results-driven guy and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Payton. Good evening. My name is Keon Payton. I'm currently the senior pastor of New Bethel Missionary Baptist Church here in the city of Pontiac, uh, where I've served for the past 12 years. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've actually dedicated my whole life uh, to public service. Uh, in addition to pastoring, I've served as a public, public educator, uh, teaching kindergarten and fifth grade. I've served as a uh, school board member uh, and president of a local school board here in the city of Pontiac. I've also served on the Oakland County and continue to serve on the Oakland County Workforce Development Task Force uh, that's currently organized by our county executive, Brooks Patterson. I currently serve on the Pontiac Promise Zone, where I have been serving for the past several years, uh, which is an opportunity to ensure that our young people receive the funding that they need to uh, receive a quality education. I've also served in my previous years as a board member for the J Shop, which is a local employment opportunity for autistic residents. I have a very diverse uh, background with, with my professional experience, uh, and I have certainly the educational foundation to ensure uh, that we bring resources back to this community that will help uplift this community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters. Uh, I'm not going to use the word I um, in my introduction today. Uh, we have been able to do so many things tremendously together in this city, and I hope to do it in District 29. Most recently, uh, the Youth Recreation Center, uh, the youth finally have a recreation center in the city of Pontiac. It took 13 years in order to get that accomplished, and a lot of people that sit in this audience helped to make that happen. I co-authored uh, that particular piece of legislation. Uh, I've served Pontiac uh, through its roughest period, and now that the city is right at promise, 
uh, it's a great opportunity because people want to come here. They want to work here. They want to be involved. They want to even lead here because of the work we were able to do. When I first became a city council person, uh, we couldn't get people to even run in these seats. And now we have people all over the state commending Pontiac on where it's going, and we hope to make the region even better. So I want to thank you for the time. I look forward to answering real questions tonight. And again, I want to thank the League of Women Voters. Thank you very much. Now we'll start with the questions. Uh, we're going to begin with Mr. Bowman, and each question will start with the next person in rotation. Uh, this is uh, the first question. What do you see as the, the biggest problem in Pontiac that can be addressed in the legislature? which goes with this question, what would be your first order in Lansing? So what's your first order of business in Lansing, and what do you consider the biggest problem that you can do for Pontiac in the legislature? Mr. Bowman. I believe that one of our biggest problems here in the city of Pontiac, and it's not just the city of Pontiac, it's across the state wide, uh, our educational levels, making sure that our children have the ability to compete on a global scale, not just a local scale. Uh, I believe in making sure that we bring the funding and put the things that are in place to make sure that that actually happens. For example, House Bill, House Bill 4142 that was sponsored in 2017, which actually allowed uh, for teachers to actually be able to make sure that they're getting monies and stipends while they're actually working and going to college that will so in an attempt to attract more teachers more qualified teachers for people who will really want to come out and do what's right and working in the school district uh, we also want to make sure that we're supporting and sponsoring other bills and bringing forth other legislation that will create more funding a lot of people have a misconception and they believe that uh, the lottery is actually paying into our school system and it is but when the lottery pays in the state pulls back we want to make sure that we have adequate funding levels for our children and our schools and I believe that's something that we have to make sure that we're pounding on regularly Thank you. Ms. Carter. Yes, one of the first things I would address is inequities across the board, not only in education, but in infrastructure, also in uh, accountability to our seniors, to our veterans, to our homeless. You don't find this disparity only in Pontiac. You find it all over the state. It's up in the Upper Peninsula right now where some of the poorest people in our state live. And these, these residents have to go without heating, would have to go without proper insulation in their homes, and they depend on the state to allocate money equitably across the board to everyone. One of the biggest um, uh, responsibilities of a legislator is to make sure funds are appropriate, appropriated equally and equitably across the state. One of the first things I would do is continue the work I've been doing for the last four years, which is work on the Appropriations Committee to make sure that the money is distributed equitably in our state. Thank you. Mr. DeMand. I believe the biggest problem facing the community of Pontiac and uh, all the other cities in this district and across the state of Michigan is that the people who have, we've elected for the past several years, I would say over the past 15 years, have lost sight of what the real issue is. And so we drag everyone out to talk about potholes, right? And then what, what are we missing? People are going to bed hungry, and they're going to bed cold, and they're going to bed in the wintertime, they can't get any heat. And we're talking about potholes when the government, that's what the government is there for. You're, you're there to make sure the roads are safe, correct? So why are we dragging everybody out after a long shift at work and they're getting under, they're, they're underpaid for their work, they're working hard and we're talking about potholes at a meeting. We should be working on making sure that we're putting people in these offices who care about the outcomes of each individual. That's what government is. It's supposed to be blind to color, it's supposed to be blind to money and wealth, and it's not. And that's what I'm running for. Because we need people in charge who care about each and every one of you in this room, no matter where you're from and what your background is. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Yeah, so we have an opportunity to look at some short-term and long-term goals, but the one that I will, will speak specifically on today is that we have an issue of talent, uh, a, a retracting or attaining talent and also attracting talent to the state of Michigan, uh, and in particular in certain areas uh, in southeast Michigan as well. Uh, so there are some low-hanging fruit opportunities that we can take advantage of. I've already started having discussions with uh, people on both sides of the aisle who are current representatives uh, where there is a bill that we can currently go after uh, that hasn't been uh, brought to the table yet where we essentially add a tax credit to individuals uh, to their student loans if they're willing to stay and work in the state of Michigan. Uh, we know that student loans are a major issue for a lot of people. I have them, so I've experienced that. But on the flip side of that, if we want to keep talent here, then it's going to be important that uh, we make it favorable for individuals to be able to do so. And part of that is saying, hey, we'll pay a tax credit toward your loan so that you ultimately stay here and work in our state. And I think that uh, that's the first thing that I would attack the low-hanging fruit. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Payton. I believe that the primary issue is education. We must make certain that all of our young people have an opportunity to receive a quality education to ensure that they will have a life uh, and a livelihood for themselves and for their families. Uh, and certainly equity in education is, a, is a primary, uh, of primary importance to me. While serving as president of the uh, Life Skills Board here in the city of Pontiac, I actually made a formal presentation to the Pontiac School Board in 2012 uh, to uh, try to bring a collaboration between charter schools and public schools. Currently, we know that in the city of Pontiac, we have seven charters, uh, which has bled the Pontiac School District and has caused uh, significant deficits uh, because they can't, ha haven't been able to retain their students. Uh, I proposed in 2012 an opportunity that would retain millions of dollars annually uh, in the Pontiac School District for our one school, and certainly there are many schools also in that similar predicament who could have benefited from those types of strategic partnerships and collaborations. I've tried to advocate for that. I will certainly also be, be able to do that on the state level as well. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you. Uh, everybody before me mentioned all of the symptoms. We have to get to the root of the problem, and the root of the problem is in places like Pontiac and other places, there's a lack of implementation of consistent vision. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, Arbon Hills didn't exist. That was Pontiac Township. Now the reason that Amazon is not here is because of lack of talent, lack of education, other things, but it was a lack of regional collaboration. As a state representative, you're going to need somebody to be able not only to stand in, but actually to facilitate those conversations that move those partnerships, mm -hmm. people to call the MEDQ and other places to make sure that all of the money that's available to bring the big factories that's going to bring the jobs to the people come at the right time and in the right place, but they don't harm the residents and what is underlying is disproportional treatment one of the key things in Pontiac that we have to depend on the state to do is deal with our liquor stores if people can't get quality meat quality groceries we have to get those bread basket issues too while we also work on a dynamic plan to make sure that we have a solid future thank you we'll start the next question with Ms. Carter uh, this is again this is about education what is your position on charter schools and why and is the uh, state lottery uh, be money benefiting the schools in Pontiac? My position on charter schools is that 17% of charter schools are effective, okay? But that's 83% of charter schools that get their funding and then bring the schools back to public education, which have to educate children regardless. We do not have the option of sending our children anywhere else. Once charter schools go through per pupil count, the money goes back to the public schools. My position on them is I'm not against charter schools, but I am very pro-public education. I come from public education, therefore I support public education. As far as the lottery is concerned, that money doesn't go to public education. You need to really understand how, how the funding equation is allocated. Uh, communities that are economically challenged like Pontiac and poverty districts do not get the same resources that more affluent districts get. Therefore, I would lobby and advocate very strongly for equitable funding across the board for every child. Thank you. Mr. DeMann. Thank you. So I, I am for more public education in terms of that I, I believe when you ask for, as uh, Governor John Engler did years ago, for a uh, competition in the education sphere, when you ask for a uh, for profit motive in schools, you, you, you get what you pay for. And I believe you've seen those results. I've worked directly with these schools, uh, not as closely as uh, Brenda Carter has or as uh, uh, Mr. Payton has, but I, I've done so in terms of collaborating on different programs for uh, March's Reading Month and other activities that we've done uh, from some of the organ organizations I work with. And walking into charter schools and seeing how they're handled is something that is disgusting, if you, uh, if you ask me. And think about it this way. if you. If you were to say we live in a predominantly uh, minority uh, uh, community here in Pontiac, um, 50 years ago, if you could say to someone that if you were a minority, your education system would be poor and would be, uh, sorry. sorry. You can finish your sentence. Okay. Yeah. If you could say 50 years ago that you would, you, you would see the results would be behind in failing schools in those areas, and that you fast forward to now and we're still addressing the same problems, because in the, in the interim, we've elected people who have put the interest of people with the, uh, with the money in their pockets, who've lined their campaigns with uh, donations. That's, that's the issue. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jackson. 
Yeah, so as a, uh, an individual who had uh, an opportunity to experience public education most of his life, but also private education uh, when I was afforded an opportunity to attend Cranbrook, um, I, I've, I believe that pro-choice is the important thing. I'm not against charter schools. I think parents should have the ability to choose what they think is best for their children. I think we get into a, uh, a dangerous space when we start to dictate or try to dictate where parents should send their children for education. Uh, on the flip side of that, I do believe that with our educational system, we need to be better about investing in it. Uh, I'm not for, uh, I'm against for-profit charter schools. There are some non-profit charter schools that have had some good success and, and they should have an opportunity uh, to do so, but we need to hold charter schools to the same standards that we hold public schools to. And if we aren't willing to hold them accountable, then we're going to continue to see the same issues that we see now. And that's my position on charter versus public. But we need to invest in how we go about educating and we need to invest uh, into our teachers who are the most valuable pieces to our society. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Payton. I fully support uh, quality education. Uh, and I feel that quality education should be uh, afforded for every child uh, through the public sector. However, we currently have charters that exist in the state of Michigan. Uh, charters aren't going anywhere. And so we have to uh, develop creative solutions uh, for strategic uh, partnerships and collaborations between the two. So for example, when uh, that's going to be too much for me to get into here, um, I will just say that uh, here I, I fully support public education, quality education, uh, how best that comes. If parents feel that they will have a better chance to educate their kids uh, and receive quality education in the charter schools, then parents have every right to place their child where they feel their child has the best chance uh, to uh, succeed in life. However, that ought to be for every child in the state of Michigan. I fully support funding. Um, uh, early childhood as well as universal pre-k for all children uh, it's a program that I'm currently running in my church a zero to three early childhood development program uh, we have seen the success of young people when they are engaged at that very early stage in life and I feel from a legislative standpoint we have to ensure that the resources are there for every kid to receive quality education in the state of Michigan thank you uh, can you repeat the question please How, wait a minute <laughs> Um, how do you propose, oh, wait a minute, that was the other question. Oh yeah, what is your position on charter schools? And is the lottery money benefiting the, the schools in Pontiac? Uh, I don't know if the lottery money is benefiting the schools in Pontiac. I do know that uh, the school district gets about less than 8,000 a kid. They just came out with a report that if all things were equal, it takes $9,500 to educate a child properly. If you add poverty or other challenges, it takes 13,500 to do that effectively. When you talk about charter schools, I'm, I'm a pro-union person. Let's just be, uh, I can be as frank as possible, I only got a minute. Um, but the problem that I see uh, with charter schools is if they were the solution, then they would be everywhere. And if you look at where they are, they're predominantly in communities with low financial strength. When you look at other places, those become the private schools and they're not ciphering off the public school money. And so if you look at the other people in the 29th district that we represent, you don't find charters in those areas. And so we need to be consistent and make sure that every child is valued and every child has a quality of education. If you take the money from uh, one pot and put it in another pocket, you haven't solved the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bowman. I actually am 100% for uh, pro-education as well. And uh, when we start talking about charter schools, we have to understand what they are. In Auburn Hills, they have an alternative school that's actually governed by the city, the school district itself, but yet and still, it's an alternative school. Uh, the city of Pontiac has gone through a number of changes. One of the biggest issues that we have is our per pupil allocation. It's not keeping up with everyone around us. Now, there's an equation and a formula that they use to dictate and to come up with that. Nevertheless, if West Bloomfield gets $12,500 per student, Pontiac gets $7,500, close to $8,000 per student, there's a disparity gap that has to be bridged. Our lottery system is not going to fix our schools. And it's not the school building. We need to get past that. University of Michigan has buildings that are hundreds of years old. But people are standing in line to get into the University of Michigan because of what's going on inside the building. That's what we have to fix. The monies will help to attract the proper teachers that we need who care and are willing to educate our children. But until we can fix what's going on inside the school, we're going to continue down the road that we've been on. Okay. There's some other education questions here. This is the next one. What will you, and we'll start with um, Mr. Demand. What will you do to raise high school rates at, of graduation? graduation rates and how will you bring more scholarships and college information to the children of District 29? 
So I think the first thing we need to do is leverage all the assets that we have. There are, there are organizations out there who are waiting to help. Who are, we just need to connect them with the people in this community. There are, I've seen it out there in my travels and working in different communities. And um, I think right now we just need to make sure that we're information sharing, that we're collaborating, that we're not fighting with each other over the solution to the problem. We're identifying the problem, and then we're working together to solve it. I think that's the, the key right there. Also, there are different resources out there in terms of making sure that the financial burden, as of right now, it is what it is. It costs a lot of money to go to school. That hasn't changed, but we cannot stop that from uh, having people get into schools. So we need to connect them right now with the funding that's out there. There is grant dollars out there. There are applications out there wh where you can submit and make sure that you're getting funding. So you're not intimidated. You're, you're not worried about working too many jobs at once just to pay for the astronomical rates of uh, college uh, education. You're, you're also getting that funding that's there. So um, I think we just need to start working together and, and, and not yelling at each other about the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Uh, I think the answer to that, to that question is innovation. Um, it's interesting that we still, in, in many places, we still teach children the same way that they were learning uh, in the 70s and 80s, right? And so our kids learn in different ways now. They, they have access to different things earlier in life. They have access to more information. So it's really important that we cater the way that we teach new generations in the way that they know how to learn. I think that's the first thing. Another thing is allowing skills and trades uh, to be a more prominent uh, and pertinent part in education. Uh, the formal way of education isn't for everyone, and we have to, to learn to understand and respect that. So by allowing more skills and trades uh, and, and allowing that to be more of a focus in our educational system, I think we'll have a better opportunity. And, and the last part in how we help people graduate uh, is community partnerships. Uh, we have three hospitals within a couple of mile radius of each other so why aren't we focusing more of our resources towards kids being able to intern in different hospitals learning the medical field and then ultimately having jobs once they graduate I think once we become more innovative we'll have a much smarter government thank you thank you mr. Payton can you please restate the question what will you do to raise the high school graduation rate and how will you bring more scholarships and college information to the children of district 29 I think in order for children to be successful in completing their K-12 education, uh, their educational foundation is, is critical. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm a very strong advocate and supporter for early childhood development, uh, as well as universal pre-K for all kids. Uh, recent statistics uh, for the state of Michigan have shown that Michigan's fourth graders are currently demonstrating 29% proficiency in reading, ranking us 41st in the country. Uh, we are one, only one of three states to suffer decline in fourth grade reading in the past 12 years. Uh, clearly we see uh, that the challenges with many, many of our young people start in fourth grade and above. So we have to do more to invest in ensuring that their educational foundation is secure from, from ages zero to three. And so again, investing in early childhood development as well as investing uh, in universal pre-K. Uh, and also I think that this, the state has caught on that conventional education has not uh, done well in servicing our young people. Uh, but we have to tap into their creativity and gifts of discovery. Uh, and so the high scope uh, curriculum uh, that is currently being developed uh, throughout the state of Michigan, primarily right here in, in uh, Pontiac with Oakland University primarily and some other schools that are implementing high scope uh, have caught on to what's required in order to ensure that our young people are secure in that zero to three age bracket. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Uh, yes, I sit on the uh, uh, Oakland University uh, Pontiac Early Childhood Partnership. And if kids can't read by third grade, next year the law kicks in that the legislator pass that they will be held back or there's going to be some additional things that are needed in order to bring that child up to that level. So we have to invest in reading, we have to invest in teachers. But one of the things is we have to remove the barriers that keep kids from being able to get educated. When you're 16 years old and you decide that you've matriculated through 10 years of school and now you don't want to finish the last two, there's a lack of hope. And so somebody needs to wrap their arms around not only those kids, because it's not in all pockets, but kids dropping out happens all over, no matter how affluent your parents are or how poor. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody just said to me the other day, you can be poor in pocket, but not poor in mind. And one of the things we need to make sure that is done is each child needs a personal evaluation. We do it for our special needs children, but we should do that across the board. Every child needs an evaluation to find out where they are, how they learn, how they can be uh, motivated uh, into what they want to do next. Thank you. Mr. Bowman. Could you repeat the question one more time, please? Yeah. What will you do to raise high school graduation rates, and how will you bring more scholarships and college information to the children of District 29? 
the number one thing that we have to make sure that we're paying attention to and watching is, um, and no one likes to talk about it, but it's not just the schools that have the issues. I coached football for a number of years, and we had a couple of kids who coached, we coached, and they would slack a lot of times, but when their parent would show up for a game, that kid would turn a light on and would light up and perform admirably. And I'm saying that we have to get the parents more actively involved in the educational process of our children. I agree, we have to be more innovative. Children are learning a little bit differently. Now, the Prometheus boards are one thing, but we have to move beyond those and go to the next level. The company that I work with right now, we're trying to work with Oak Tech to bring robotics into there for them so the kids can start learning robotics. Everybody's not going to go to college, but everybody has an opportunity to be able to earn a fair, livable wage that's to give them a better quality of your life. And so working with the robotics company that I work with, technology is something Something that we have to introduce at an early age uh, and I believe uh, when my wife ran an in-home daycare at a for a number of years the one thing that we made sure that every kid that left her daycare could read before they left that daycare and I can tell you everybody's graduated from high school thank you miss Carter yes this is so wonderful because I'm on the ground day to day every single day so I know what's needed and one of the greatest needs that we have to uh, close that achievement gap is pastoral care for our children one and that's meaning reaching out to our parents the 25 to 45, and providing the opportunities that they need. Many of the parents right now are working two or three jobs to make ends meet. So a lot of time the children have to be at home by themselves. They become the primary caregiver. So as far as uh, raising the achievement gap, there's nothing wrong with our children. Our children are achieving when they're given the opportunity to achieve, when they're given the funding to achieve. One of the things, like I said, being involved day to day is I know that right now that we're in our third cohort of uh, uh, children graduating from uh, St. Joe Hospital with a nursing degree. When they graduate from high school, they have a full nursing degree. We also have a career and technical education program that coincides with the building construction trades. So these opportunities are there for the community. It's just a matter of getting in the day-to-day -day operation and assisting our parents in educating their children. Thank you. The next question will start with Mr. Jackson. Uh, someone in the audience wants to know, um, how are you planning to address wrongful convictions? And what are your plans to address the quick, the, the police quickness to resort to violence? As a state rep, is what do you feel like you can do about these problems? Okay, so can you give give that to me right. one more time? Okay, thank you. Uh, address wrongful convictions is the one, mm -hmm. and then the police quickness to resort to violence. Okay. So one of my uh, major platforms is actually criminal justice reform. <clears throat> It's really important that uh, we look across the board and we understand it. And I was um, fortunate enough to receive an endorsement from the Michigan Association from Justice for Justice because they understand uh, where our values align. And so when we talk about wrongful convic convictions, uh, Michigan is a state that has, on average, an individual incarcerated for 50 months, whereas our neighbor in Ohio is, on average, 30 months, which is similar to most states in the Midwest. Uh, I think that we have an issue with lumping all of the incarceration issues together or crimes together instead of having specialty courts as we've seen uh, throughout many states in America where you can have specialized courts for veterans, specialized courts for mental illness and other things so that that isn't the focus. Uh, with regards to police brutality, uh, it's uh, an issue and I think uh, one of the ways that we saw that is, is folks like Deputy Gil Garrett is really involved in the community. I think community policing uh, solves those issues issues so that they understand what's going on in the community that they're policing over. Thank you. Mr. Payton. I think we have to ensure that all citizens and residents who are arrested are receiving due, fair due process. Uh, just Sunday, a pastoral colleague of mine uh, was arrested in front of his church uh, because of an incident that had taken place where a, me a member of his church who had mental illness uh, had assaulted one of his members. Uh, the member called the police. The police showed up. Uh, and they arrested this pastor without asking any questions uh, and made him sit in jail for three hours uh, without having the ability to make a phone call uh, or to be able uh, to co contact his lawyer. We have to start from the point of contact, ensuring that every resident from the time that they are accosted are receiving fair, just treatment, and then ensuring that when they go through the, the judicial process uh, that judges are fair and equitable as it relates to their sentencing and how they're in, uh, ensuring uh, that they are executing uh, judgment on those who are standing before them. Thank you. 
Mr. Williams. Yeah, I think the panelists talked about what we can do for wrongful convictions, but we have a whole swath of people who are dealing, uh, who just made mistakes. And if you get booked with two felonies in the state of Michigan, you can't get an expungement. And we have to be able to work after people serve their time. They have to be able to come back into society, not only have a place to work, a place to raise their families, but they need to be treated with dignity. And so as a legislator, we can change the expungement law right now and make it where if these crimes all happen in the same occurrence or on the same day, you just get rid of it. Those are the simple steps that we can start taking to change it. Uh, the way to deal with police is what I deal with all the time. Uh, before we had uh, the Oakland County Sheriff, we used to have Pontiac police and I would have to go and talk to the chief in order to make sure that this person was treated fairly or not. We still uh, have a law on 50 of district subcommittee uh, uh, that we use in the city right now, but it's a different mentality. But when you have a police department, you need to talk to them directly. All law enforcement needs to be talked to directly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bowman. Thank you. Um, really and truly, at one point in time, the city of Pontiac had what's called a, a cat officer, and each cat officer was assigned to each district, and that particular cat officer, he dealt with the citizens in that district. As a state legislator, what I would do is work to create legislation that would require that law enforcement who are in certain cities come into those communities and begin to spend time in those communities so that they can get to know the people in those communities. Currently, right now, we have House Bill 4536, which was created by Public Act 65, which gives an opportunity to have records are sponged. So what we need to do is strengthen those bills that are already on the table and work to get those passed. We also have House Bill 420, 4296, which deals with sentencing guidelines. When a person gets sentenced, we need to make sure that they make their sentence they're sentenced fairly and equitably, not just because they have one or two strikes. And then we got Senate Bill 0014, which gives employees incentive, employers incentives to hire ex-felons. So when we start talking about creating legislation, those are the types of bills that are on the table that we have to make sure we're still supporting and creating uh, addendums to. Thank you, Ms. Carter. I think we should create an economic environment in a community that would mitigate uh, the, the classroom, the prison pipeline, and that's what it is, basically. You've got people are just railroaded right into the prison system, and once they get in the prison system, it becomes cyclical, okay? Over and over again, job opportunities are not provided when the, when the prisoners come, when the people are expunged from the prison, well, excuse me, released from, from the prison, and the expungement opportunity is not provided for them, nor is it an economic base for them to support their families. So I believe we need to stop that cycle that runs right from the, from the high schools into the prison system for whatever reason. I also agree very strongly that police and the community need to be worked together. We need to have programs out there. We've had programs out there where Kano Phillips have invited police officers to meet with our youth in our community so they can get to understand and they can, the police can hear the youth, the youth can hear the police, and they get a better understanding of working with each other. Thank you. Mr. Demand. And this is an issue where I've worked on directly with uh, someone involved in community uh, engagement programs, which is you have to work directly with the citizens, but the citizens have to have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. It can't just be an officer coming into the street for the basketball game or for a barbecue. Right. It has to be citizens directly involved in making decisions of what's governing them from the law enforcement standpoint. It's protect and serve, not protect and shoot. So we have to make sure that we have people working together, okay? So when you're putting in pro, uh, these programs in place, we talk about community and policing, make sure that whatever legislation you force one of us to get through is that it has mandatory civilian involvement in that leadership process. Trust me, that's where the change has to happen. There, it cannot be law enforcement directors making it for, for themselves because, you know what, at the highest levels, they're politicians as well. You know, you're, you're talking about your county sheriffs and all that. They're, they're looking to get reelected and they're looking to talk about law and order. So we need to have civilians at the, at the table making sure that the change is real and that you come back every, every so often to make sure you're checking to make sure the officers are sticking to that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with Mr. DeMann. In, inheriting the economic disparities in the 29th District, how will you utilize your political position Excuse to bring? Me. I think it, is it on me? Yeah. No, okay. okay. We, so we, we were thrown <laughs> off when you said Mr. Demand. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Payton. <laughs> <laughs> I've only done this 20 years, so. <laughs> Still learning. All right, Mr. Payton. 
Inheriting the ec economic disparities in the 29th District, how will you utilize your political position to bring economic growth and social equality to the citizens here? Economic, okay, well, let's, let's start with uh, economic growth. Well, certainly, um, here we're in the city of Pontiac, and we know that we're just emerging from an emergency management situation uh, where our previous uh, local legislators and our uh, mayors perhaps weren't as fiscally responsible as they should have been. Uh, certainly, uh, on a state level, there's not much that can be done there. Uh, that's something that's with local control, ensuring that our council and our mayors are working effectively together uh, to ensure that they are properly planning uh, for their economic growth and success. Uh, and so what I would encourage, uh, being uh, in my previous experience, I was a Midwest Regional Director for an organization, and we managed a $46 million budget. And one of the ways that we were able to do that effectively was to ensure that we're not just managing our resources uh, on, on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, and in many cases, not on a, a two-year budget, uh, but on a three- or four-year projected budget to ensure that we are meeting the goals that, we, that need to be met and, and to uh, ensure that we receive the success that we need to have. Uh, so I think those, that's the way that I would encourage uh, through my uh, influence as a state representative uh, those types of conversations to ensure that they're happening on a local level. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Uh, one of the key things is we have to deal with revenue sharing uh, for cities. The state owes the city of Pontiac $180 million, but I was just at the Kego City Council meeting and they were talking about uh, trying to get a millage and do things to bring back more police officers. Across the board in District 29, because this is bigger than Pontiac even though we're in Pontiac City Hall, there has to be budgets that reflect the communities. The state needs to send more monies back to cities, back to villages, in order for them to operate because they make the best decision. All politics is local and the state has gotten away from that tremendously. When we send more money to the state than we get back and then the state says, well, we're going to send in emergency management uh, because you have a a $12 million shortfall when we owe you $20 million doesn't make sense. That's, that's bad uh, uh, responsibility. So the cities are creatures of the state, but if we're going to have a strong state of Michigan, then we have to have strong cities. And the way to deal with that economic disparity is to make sure that if we're sending money to the state, we get it back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bowman. Uh, well, number one, the city of Pontiac between the uh, years of 2002 and 2012 lost $50 million in revenue sharing from the state of Michigan. So we need to make sure that we're getting the funds that we're supposed to receive. Uh, number two, we need to make sure that we're creating ordinances that will make sure that we're bringing quality businesses to our city. Uh, we don't want to just have someone come for sake of having them come in and say that we have a new business here. We want someone who wants to be a good corporate partner with our citizenry. Currently right now, House Bill 4544, is the which handles the strategic fund for the state of Michigan, which was created by Public Act 270, which approves loans, grants, and helps helps with uh, create community revitalization programs. It also works with this community development, re, uh, excuse me, community development uh, block grant dollars. Those are funds that come to the cities from the state. We need to make sure that we're engaging, enhancing those bills, supporting those bills, and creating the legislation that will move them forward so that we can make sure that we're getting the economic growth that we deserve here in the city of Pontiac and throughout District 29. Thank can you, you. Can you please re repeat the question? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, inheriting inheriting the economic disparities the 29th district in the 29th district how will you utilize your political position to bring economic growth and social equality to the citizens here thank you i'm so glad you brought up economic growth and social equality together because one of my issues that i stand very firm on is I am for economic economic development, but not at the cost of community development. Right now, you see in districts of poverty, cities in poverty all across Michigan, Detroit being a classic example of it, where gentrification has taken over these cities, and those who have not have been moved to the, to the outskirts, and those who have are now occupying those cities. It's not only in Michigan, it's all over the, all over the country. You can go to New Orleans and see it there. But the bottom line of it is, I believe strongly that any business that come into a community, whether it's Pontiac or any of Auburn Hills, Kego Harbor, doesn't matter, should bring a program to that city that allows the opportunity for the residents to get a piece of the pie as well. I believe that the residents deserve to grow as the businesses grow. Thank you. Mr. DeMann. And I think it's been brought up already, and at the first uh, forum we had, I mentioned it as well, which is the revenue sharing. I worked directly for the revenue sharing reporting 
uh, when I worked in the city of Ypsilanti, the city manager's office, because the city was decimated and lost a bunch of uh, dollars that were supposed to come from the state. The state put a program in place called EVIP, which basically told cities that they had to earn every penny if, if they wanted to get the money back at the state withheld. And so then you have people who have services. We're lo we lost uh, police and firefighters. So you talk about a city of Ypsilanti of 20,000 people, but you have crimes uh, going up through the roof, and the state was withholding funding from our police department and from our fire services. So we cannot have that. We can't have games from the executive office of the state which allow for something like that to happen. So we, you put into place immediately legislation that bars the executive from any contingency-based revenue sharing. It's your dollars. You paid into the system. It comes back to you in revenue sharing. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Uh, this, is, this is really where um, regional collaboration comes into play. And so I've had conversations with not only county commissioners that represent areas in the 29th district, but every municipality as well. And what I'm intending to do is bring everyone together to understand who has what resources and what tools each municipality can pull to the table so that we can collaborate and say this is an industry in which we all can focus on uh, that would be good for all of the municipalities. Aside from that, during my travels, and I've, you know, during my time as a project manager, I traveled to 14, 15, 17 states across North America and countries. Um, the important thing that I saw is each city that was successful had a relationship between its government, a good relationship with its uh, nonprofits, and a good relationship with its small businesses. And when those three work in tandem, there is a bigger or better opportunity for success. And so when we start talking about things like RIPs or pay for success where uh, a nonprofit can take care of a situation better than a municipality can and then that municipality pays that nonprofit, then you start to see local municipality successes that we'd like to see from an economic standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to start the next question with Mr. Williams. What is your position on Michigan auto insurance redlining? We have the highest rate in the nation. Yeah, uh, redlining is a huge problem uh, in Michigan, especially in these municipalities. But we have to look at the conditions that are creating not only the redlining, but we have to deal with the lobbyists that are in Lansing. The insurance industry uh, has mega lobbies. There might be a lobbyist in here tonight watching. And so uh, it's going to really take strong leadership to stand up to that. And so if you look at who's sending the mail to each one of these candidates, there's at least 15 or 16 from insurance companies and other places that's just been in the mailbox. We have to make sure that we take money out of the politics. We just found out the case uh, with Janet versus Ask Me today that says that now people can get union services without paying for unions. And so they're, they're weakening the unions, and at the same time, they're putting more and more money in the politics. That's how we lose as people. And so the people united will never be defeated is the slogan, right? But money answered for all things. And so if we don't take the money out of the rooms, then we're not going to be able to do what we need to do to change redlining. It's a reason that they've been allowed to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bowman. The well, first thing we have to realize, number one, is that the insurance industry is the richest industry in the United States. They're a $7 trillion a year industry. So when you figure that out, then you understand real quickly who's paying the lobbyists. And they create boards within side of the states who oversee the insurance industry. But the boards are created by the insurance industry. The people who are appointed to the oath boards are people who work within the insurance industry. So first, you have to break up the monopoly that's taking place there. Number one, our current state representative, Tim Rimel, actually sponsored House Bill 4264, which allows opting out of PIP, which is personal injury protection if you simply just do that on your application or when you're renewing your insurance and you can waive that the PIP that will actually decrease your insurance rates House Bill 5125 which is also sponsored by our current representative Tim uh, Grimel it decreases the no-fault insurance rate it did not pass at this point in time but we have to make sure that we don't let that die the no-fault insurance rate is something that is really crippling us right now our catastrophic insurance fund in the state of Michigan has 19 billion dollars in it and with that $19 billion, my time is up. Ms. Carter. Thank you. This is a very sensitive issue right here because the people who are most affected by the laws that would uh, uh, regulate the who gets the no-fault insurance are the ones a lot of people actually need that health care. They need that insurance. And if it's capped at a certain point, then the people who need it the most may be cut off from it. So the redlining, yes, it, I agree totally 100% that the insurance lobbyist is out there. I've gotten several letters, go this way, go that way. But we have to really take into account what, how this will, bottom line, affect 
the everyday citizen. Okay? It's not about getting into who's going to who's going to support a certain piece of legislation. It's about who's going to protect the people that we are sent to Lansing to represent. Okay, so that calls for us getting out there and listening to the people, looking at the demographics in District 29 and determining how best we serve the constituents we have. Thank you. Mr. DeMand. And I'd like to further that point that Brenda just made, which is that we're talking about something that we've been dealing with for the past 15, 20 years, talking about high ins insurance rates. And I worked in the governor's office back in 2006, and that was uh, top three in the concerns. It was jobs, it was auto insurance rates, home, insur home, on home owners insurance rates, excuse me. And what I'm concerned about is in another two years and four years, we're going to be talking about high auto insurance rates. And we're not paying attention to the fact that people are not making any money. They're working jobs, multiple jobs, for hours and hours. They're losing time with their family. They're not here in this room because they're tired because they're taking care of so many other issues right now, and we're talking about the same problems because the money has flooded in and it has controlled our elected, elected officials. Yes. I'm not accept, accepting any corporate donations or anything like that. It's basically all my, my, my investments and, uh, of course, uh, some relatives or whatnot, but I don't accept any of these funds because we're going to come back here with the same problem because the people have flooded the, the money in, and so what we believe is the major problem is diverting us from what the real problems are. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Yeah, so Michigan, uh, to the tune of 80%, pays higher with regards to car insurance, 50% in places like Pontiac, and Detroit even higher than the 80%, 50% higher than that. Um, far too often, we are allowing non-driving factors to dictate how much we pay as individuals for our car insurance. So certainly it's a problem, but there's a holistic approach that we can look at as well. Uh, we are allowing our car insurance to be our health care providers at the same time, whereas if we really push for free health care for everyone, then I think we would relinquish some of those issues that we're suffering with uh, when it comes to car insurance. And so I think there's a holistic approach that we're missing that if we move in a direction, I think everyone up here probably uh, supports uh, free, free health care for everyone, then I think we work toward fixing that problem. Uh, aside from that, you know, you will hear people say we aren't taking uh, any corporate money. And it's true because we can't, as candidates, take any corporate money. It's against the law. And, and so I won't be taking any corporate money for this particular campaign either. You can't. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Payton. Redlining is certainly a problem, and as it has already been alluded to uh, by some of my colleagues uh, who are running, uh, the personal insurance protection uh, is certainly an issue that needs to be resolved. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Tim Grimel uh, did, a, did a great job uh, helping to offer that legislation, but we need to expand it. Mm -hmm. um, insurance companies in the state of Michigan aren't, uh, we aren't the only state that has wealthy insurance companies. Uh, there are many states that do. Uh, we're just paying higher insurances. Uh, so we need to address the PIP, and that starts with making certain that we have legislators who understand the process. Uh, and as much as lobbyists are very much uh, involved with a number of decisions that are made in Lansing and in Washington, D.C., lobbyists, as Chris alluded to, don't pay legislators directly. They develop policy. I had the opportunity to understand how lobbying, or, lobbying organizations work. Uh, I actually worked for the third most powerful lobbying organization in the country. That's the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Uh, I learned and understood very well what, le what uh, policymakers do uh, from the lobbyist's standpoint, and we just need to make certain that we have legislators who can read, understand, and decipher uh, the information that is developed by that lobbying policy to ensure that it's something that's going to be in the best interest of the people, not just short term, but long term Thank as well. You. We'll start this question with Mr. Bowman. <coughs> There are three different ballot initiatives on medical marijuana that will be on the ballot. Uh, what is the best choice for Pontiac and why? Uh, number one, I believe that, uh, first let me, as a precursor, I don't smoke marijuana, nor have I ever smoked marijuana a day in my life. So I want to give that as a precursor. <laughs> um, however, I do understand that uh, every time that it has hit a ballot in the state of Michigan, it has passed overwhelmingly. And so it's pretty safe to assume that if the millennials and the uh, younger people get out to the polls to vote, and a lot of older people too, because there are some 70s uh, uh, people that are around from the hippie movement still, <laughs> that it will pass. 
Uh, I personally uh, would prefer number three, which is uh, opting out. However, it's not about what I want. It's what the people want. Mm -hmm. And if the people decide this is something that they want, we represent them, then this is what we must do. But I believe legislation must be put in place, and I applaud the council for what they've done thus far by going ahead and putting some parameters in place. But even those need to be a little bit more stronger just to make sure that uh, our city isn't overrun by those. Thank you. Ms. Carter. My position on this because I represent children. I'm very concerned about this legislation flooding communities like Pontiac, and they're usually pointed towards communities that are economically challenged. Uh, there is some real risk in, in bringing what I heard 20 uh, marijuana dispensaries to Pontiac. I agree with the City Council's uh, assessment that if these dispensaries come to Pontiac, that they should be as far away from churches, schools, playgrounds, or anywhere that you will find anybody 21 years or younger. Uh, the legislation, from what I'm understanding, is going to pass. It's going to pass. You know, this is an economic resource for the state and I once again I am very very firmly entrenched in the fact that if any type of business comes to Pontiac that's uh, uh, that's benefiting the business then there should be some benefit in it for the people as well so my personal choice on that I too would opt out thank you mr. demand I believe if it's passed, which it looks like it's going to be passed that we should make sure we're in the state legislature supporting communities who want to uh, have it district as they see fit. So I don't believe that um, if, a, if a given community doesn't want to have it located near certain building structures or playgrounds or anything like that, then we make sure that all the legislation put in place from the state standpoint supports that, that the cities, the municipalities, townships, villages can, can uh, district uh, um, these uh, dispensaries wherever they'd like. But uh, just to touch on the, a bit from the insurance question again, um, that the, the reason why the auto insurance rates are high is because the insurance companies want to make money. That's, that's what it is. So the bottom line is that we have to work together on coming together with the solutions to these problems. Instead of, uh, we're, we're talking about different things, uh, the insurance catastrophic uh, the, uh, fund, we talk about the uh, who pays primary, your Blue Cross coverage or your auto insurance coverage. The, the problem is we have the corruption at that level with the influence coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. <coughs> Uh, it seems like all of a sudden, um, and, and I'll, I'll put it this way, I have been speaking about my position on marijuana for well over a year now, uh, publicly, many, many interviews, even at that podium, before other people were forced to have to focus on it because it was on our doorsteps here in the community. Uh, and so I will repeat then what I've been repeating, I'll repeat now what I've been repeating for a long time, and it's that they should have community benefits. It is an opportunity if it's regulated and restricted correctly. Uh, aside from that, there is a real criminal justice reform opportunity. Uh, we see it in California where they are looking to expunge uh, records of misdemeanors or take felonies down uh, to um, a smaller level so that we have an opportunity to allow individuals that are our cousins, uncles, brothers, and sisters uh, to have productive lives and not be criminalized for the very thing that the state is looking to legalize and make money from. And uh, that's been my stance and it will continue to be so. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Payton. Can you please restate the question? There are three different initiatives of medical marijuana, marijuana that will be on the ballot. Which is the best choice for Pontiac and why? I will be uh, supporting um, Proposal 3, uh, which is no uh, dispensaries in the city of Pontiac. Uh, I feel at this particular time uh, we have a number of issues uh, that we need to resolve here in our city, uh, and we don't need to be engaged in adding uh, something else to that very exhaustive list of things that we already need to have to work on in the city of Pontiac. Uh, I also feel uh, that uh, Pontiac should not uh, uh, be a dumping ground. Uh, for uh, all of the negative activity that takes place uh, that's often controlled by entities or uh, things outside of, the, outside of what the, the, the community wants. Uh, for example, uh, the downtown Pontiac area is a current drop-off uh, for all those who are being released back into the community uh, right here in our downtown area. Uh, I feel that there are a number of things that are already happening here in Pontiac that continues this cycle of crime and poverty that we have, and we don't need to add something else to that list. 
Thank you. Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you. I, and I thank uh, all of the panelists uh, who gave the city council kudos. We came up with the best two proposals we could come up with. Proposal number two, which is up to four dispensaries and two of everything else, or proposal number three, which is opting out. Uh, I, like uh, former Councilman Bowman, have never smoked weed, never have an intention to do it. You can only have one habit in life. Mine was eating. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, to, be, to be honest, this is a really serious issue. So I'm asking everybody who's under the sound of my voice, regardless of how you feel about marijuana, we cannot deal with 20 dispensaries. Vote no on proposal one. Let me say that one more time, because I got 30 more seconds, I'm gonna use it, because it's gonna get re-aired. Vote no on proposal one. Vote no on proposal one. Vote no on proposal one. 20, oversaturation of anything is not good. We don't have 20 McDonald's, and, and I wanna deal with the 20 family dollars that we have in the city of Pontiac uh, that we don't have in other communities, but we have to be serious. If we're gonna have a regional collaboration with cities like Auburn Hills, we can't be different. Thank you very much. The next question will start with Ms. Carter. How can you make sure in the legislature that we have qu good quality water in Michigan? With this current legislature, I'm not sure, but <laughs> that's serious. It's, it's, it's really rotten what's, what's happening with our infrastructure. And the quality of water, it's not just a Flint problem. You don't know what's in your water now, right here in Pontiac, seriously. Okay, the infrastructure problem, the pipelines, everything, we got to make sure we have the funding. Right now, I'm hearing the legislature is not going to pass or give any more additional money to infrastructure development. We got a serious problem here. All we can do is go, and the Democrats, from what I'm understanding in Lansing, has been fighting, has been fighting to make sure that our water is clean. What we're putting in our bodies is clean right now. So the only thing I can do when I get to Lansing is to join the Democrats and whoever else has a, a reasonable mind about this problem, the water that we're getting. This is a natural resource that we must have to live. So in order to do that, we got to fight to make sure that we have clean water, clean air, no acid rain, all of this pollution that's going on in our state. Thank you. Mr. Demand. I think what we can do is we pass a law that says that if you live in Bloomfield Hills, you have to drink the same water they drink in Flint, <laughs> and then they'll make a change right away. I think probably if we look at it from the bottom line is that the communities that see these issues happen are those who have been taken advantage of for years and years and years. And I think that that's the problem, is that we need to start working with each other. There's communities all across this state, just like here, just like District 29, that are looking for a strong union to fight back. And the issue is, when we, when we get up there, we start talking about unity. We don't talk about um, anything beyond um, exercising who, like, like a litmus test, you know, like we don't, we need to put fellow Democrats through that right now. We're all fighting for the same thing, which is the water quality needs to be across the board, A plus in a state where we have five great lakes and then we still have children going to bed with lead in their bodies. So we have to work together on this to make sure that the legislation coming out of there is not allowing companies not necessarily to come in and uh, take advantage of our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Yeah, it goes back to smart government and, and being innovative. As we rebuild our infrastructure and our roads, a lot of the pipes that are underground happen to be pipes that have water in them with the very lead that we're talking about. Uh, and so as we're rebuilding our roads and hopefully doing more of a 50-year fix instead of a five-month fix uh, for individuals who want to make more money on repatching the roads, then what we can do is we can say, let's be smart about this and let's redo uh, the pipes that are underground as well. And while we're at it, since we're talking about smart governance, how about we be innovative and allow companies like, here's an example, Rocket Fiber, who was interested in coming to Pontiac, who we've had in Pontiac, to put Wi-Fi fibers underground so that as we're driving along roads, we can have Wi-Fi in our cars or on our phones. And so, again, this is about smart governance. It's about being innovative mixed with fiscal responsibility. And so when we talk about repairing the lead and waters and making sure those levels are, are clean, it starts with making sure that we have a good plan in place at the very beginning when we start to fix our infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Payton. Uh, the infrastructure is the primary uh, issue for clean water in, in Michigan. Uh, we have to do more to invest uh, in our infrastructure. Uh, I think also we need to understand that the Great Lakes, our Great Lakes here in the state of Michigan, provide 20% of the water for this country. Uh, 
Uh, and this current uh, uh, Trump administration has restricted a number of funds that we used to receive for uh, our Great Lakes, uh, and those funds are no longer available. I think that we have to work more with our, uh, our governor, uh, as well as our uh, uh, U.S. Uh, senators and congressmen and women uh, to ensure that when they're going to Lansing that they're advocating uh, for issues that will affect clean water, not just for Michigan, but for the 20 percent uh, of residents throughout the country who are being provided uh, water from our resources. So infrastructure, uh, but then also making certain that we receive the federal dollars that we need to support us uh, in strengthening uh, our Great Lakes. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Right here in this building, uh, Congressman John Conyers, almost uh, eight years ago, uh, around about this time, we passed a resolution called Water for Life, uh, saying that water was a human right and everybody deserved it uh, on the first council. And I see Pro Tem Carter in the audience, and he was uh, part of that legislation. One of the key things is uh, when the Flint water crisis happened, not only did we organize buses, we had a uh, march here in Pontiac, and I led one of those uh, stops here. But also, when it was time for the testimonials, I was there in D.C. with those people, standing with our brothers and sisters in Flint. The reason that the infrastructure hasn't changed is because we switch topics and budgets reflect priorities. If we are more concerned about potholes than we are about the quality of life that people have, then their issues are never going to get fixed. So we're going to need your help when we go to Lansing, because I can't go by myself. We're going to need everybody coming up there, marching the Capitol, saying water is for everybody. We got people in Detroit right now getting water shutoffs. That's unconscionable. But nobody's saying anything. Where is the outrage? And so we have to be consistently, as Martin Luther King would say, indignant. Thank you. Righteously indignant. Let me make that Thank clear. Thank you. Mr. Bowman. Uh, briefly, House Bill 4257 provides environmental protection against oil spills, prohibits contaminated soil, coke, and so forth from being put forth it's near some of our areas. Uh, this was sponsored by a group of state representatives who are down river. I've been in communication with them and trying to make sure that we put more teeth to that as well. Uh, right now, we can talk about infrastructure, but what's happening with our infrastructure is falling apart for a reason. It's not just in Flint. If you go back a few weeks ago, they hit mercury in the water out in uh, Rochester. It's across the state of Michigan. We have to invest in infrastructure. There's $19 billion sitting in the fund right now called the State Catastrophic Fund. That State Catastrophic Fund is unfoilable. No one knows where the money is going to that's inside of that fund. I received a letter saying that I could not FOIA it when I tried to FOIA that information as well. What I'm simply saying to you is, as a state representative, I will fight to make sure that we co-sponsor legislation across the table with some of our other people that are working in, at the state level now to make sure that we're able to tap into that State Catastrophic Fund to put the money in place. Right now, Oakland County gets about 36 or $360 million to split up for infrastructure. We're going to put more than that in if we get some of that $19 billion. Thank you. We're going to start with Mr. DeMann. Somebody in the audience wants to know, does everyone declare Democrat on all their campaign literature? And we'll start with Mr. DeMann. I absolutely do. It's uh, right at the top of uh, my literature. It says Democrat for uh, state representative. There's no ambiguity with my candidacy. Um, and to be honest with you, there's nothing ashamed uh, of, of being so, especially in this climate. I think we need to work together. Um, I think there are too many people who got divided in 2016, and it wasn't just Republican and Democrat. It was between Democrats as well with the Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton campaign. And I think we need to work to bridge that gap. I mean, that, I think that's a very important bridge to make. I still talk to friends of mine who supported Hillary right out of the gate, and I supported Bernie Sanders at the time. And I still go back and I say, well, you know, what, what about now? Do you think we should have gotten together quicker and worked together to knock on those doors in 2016? Right. And she said, well, no, I'm still a little bit angry at you. So, you know, we, we got we to gotta bridge that right away. You know, we have people who are, are thinking because you didn't get the whole pie that we still can't get enough of it to make sure that we have the things that we need to start building a good future in the state. And again, it is imperative that we are not back here in two years talking about potholes and talking about basic services that government is responsible for. Thank we should be talking about. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> Mr. Jackson. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the first piece of literature I did this year said progressive. Uh, I'm not sure if it said Democrat. It said progressive. Uh, and then everyone after that has said Democrat on it. So to answer your question bluntly, that, that's the answer to that. Uh, I am unapologetically uh, a Democrat. I, I understand that given the climate, 
uh, that we're living in right now, especially if we look at the way that the House, uh, the Senate, and our current government, uh, governor, I should say, is, is made up, the branches of government, then we have no choice but to, to work in a bipartisan effort no matter what. Uh, as a minority, it's going to be important that we have a minority in the parties, I should say. Uh, we, it's important that we have an ability to negotiate, uh, that we have an ability to compromise, never conform. There's a difference. Uh, and in my mind, my background is in negotiation, and that's the only way. If you don't have a seat at the table, you're not going to be able to accomplish anything in the state of the government that we have today. Uh, so it's important that we hold strong to our ideals as Democrats, but we also understand that we need incremental successes, and in order to do that, everyone has to push forward. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Payton. Uh, in the two or three pieces of literature that uh, our campaign has released, uh, it has not stated uh, any party. Um, it wasn't something that was intentional, uh, but as I look back on it, I actually um, appreciate uh, the independence that, that was stated there. Uh, I am uh, a member of the Democratic Party. Uh, I have voted uh, in my history primarily Democratic, uh, although I have at times uh, voted for Republican uh, candidates as well for various uh, positions. Uh, I think the challenge that we have in this current political uh, culture uh, is that uh, people are doing more of what's best for the party and not what's best for the people. Uh, and that's the slogan for our campaign. Uh, we want to go into Lansing and do what's best for the people. Uh, not so much what is the party, uh, because we see the lack of civility that's currently taking place on a federal level, uh, but believe you me, it's also taking place uh, in our local and regional government as well. Uh, and we have to go uh, uh, into rooms with Democrats, Republicans, as well as independents. I think that the uh, resignation of Judge uh, uh, Anthony today, uh, Kennedy, who uh, sat down. He was an independent. He was a moderate. And we see the importance of his ability to swing both ways. I'm sorry. I wasn't watching. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Williams. All right, so do I get more time? No, just kidding. A uh, little bit, yeah. Uh, on my literature, uh, it does not say Democrat. It says that I was president of the Young Democrats of the state of Michigan that I'm very proud of. I'm the first person from Pontiac to ever hold that seat, and I didn't hold it by myself. It was because we started at the Pontiac area, Young Democrats, under the leadership of Maddie Hatchett and others that are there. The reason I mention that is because we've had two state reps that came out of that group, Tim Milton, Tim Grimo, and I hope to be the third, Kermit Williams. And so I come from good stock, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, one of the key things, though, is uh, in this climate, we have to be true to who we are. They say uh, Republicans fall in line and Democrats fall in love. And that's why we've been losing. Everything that President Obama did has been rolled back by this current administration. And where is the outrage? At the end of the day, if you're going to run as a Democrat, be a Democrat. They give you an option to run as an independent, and I, I respect that. But do that. But if you're going to be a Democrat and say you're going to be a Democrat, then you have to work on those things. I tell people I'm dark blue because I stand for not only those progressive values, but I've been fighting. I'm the only one up here that marched on Governor Snyder's house when he was poisoning people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Mr. Bowman. I am unequivocally a card-carrying Democrat. I have been a Democrat for over 35 years. When I had uh, working on campaigns back to family members, my cousin, the late Hubert Price, my uncle, Judge Bowman, we are a family of Democrats and have been Democrats and will continue to be Democrats. Uh, all of our literature has said Democrat on it, from my understanding. I make sure that I try to proof as much of it as I can. I'm actually, I try to get it all prepared, to be honest with you. Um, when we send our stuff out, we send our information out, and it talks about who we are. It talks about our accomplishments. I tried to jo join the Young Dems, but they told me I was too old, <laughs> so I couldn't join the Young Dems. But I actually have been involved with the Democratic Party for a number of years. My late godfather, uh, Ernie Lofton, was actually president of the UAW Region 1 uh, for division. And uh, excuse me, he was unequivocally a Democrat, and so he made it clear that we had to be Democrat. We have to work with everybody, and let me make this clear. I'm going to always stand for what's best for my citizens, and I'm willing to work with whoever I've got to work with to get what's done for my citizens, Thank you. but I will not compromise my values. Ms. Carter. Yes. As probably, and I say this not sure, the only person up here that is labor, UAW Local 652, 653, I'm not sure. That's why I say I'm not sure. 75. 75, okay. All right, my brother. The whole point of the matter is that is union bread. Most union pe people are Democrats. 
We fight for working class families. We fight for working class values. Therefore, every piece of my literature not only have Democrat on it, but I proudly display the union bug. That lets everybody know when I go to union meetings, I hold them up very proudly and say, I am a Democrat and I support labor and I support working class families, 100%. Thank you. We're going to start with Mr. Jackson. What is your position on the gerrymandering ballot proposal and why? That's one of the more simple questions. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so my pos- my position is is simply that we need to take um, redistricting away from the legislation and give it back to independents or the people, however you want to phrase it. Uh, gerrymandering for far too many years has been a tool of both Republicans. Uh, and Democrats, uh, whoever was in power at the time. And so uh, each party has taken advantage of it. Uh, But what we see now is that there are situations and circumstances where uh, people aren't even having the ability to elect uh, because of the way that districts are formed. Uh, I think if you look at the stats in our Michigan Senate right now, 28 out of 34 uh, Senate seats are decided uh, in a Republican primary. Uh, and that's due to redistricting. And so I am for anti-gerrymandering, and I will, if afforded the opportunity as your next uh, Democratic representative after August, will push, uh, as I help other Democrats on the ballot, to also end end gerrymandering in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Payton. Uh, The problem with gerrymandering is the problem with uh, strict partisanship. Uh, I think, uh, as Chris alluded to, it has been uh, used as a tool uh, for respective parties uh, to get elected into office uh, and to ensure that their agenda is being promoted. I know that right now there's a statewide initiative to ensure uh, that we approach uh, redistricting from a bipartisan standpoint, but it's very difficult to achieve uh, bipartisan uh, in a culture where everyone is very partisan. Uh, And so I think that we're going to have to uh, really, again, uh, in making, in, in, in thinking about people and districts and how we uh, consider uh, drawing those lines, that we do what's it best for people uh, and not what's best for party. Uh, and so again, uh, I think that it's a problem. And I think that any time that we get caught up uh, and, and pigeonholed into respective corners of partisanship, it's always going to create problems for us when we're talking about doing what's best for people uh, and not what's doing what's best for party. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Voters, Not Politicians is the website, fully support it, uh, but we need to support other voter reform. We need no reason absentee voting. You shouldn't be able to come with your ID if you're a Michigan citizen and vote the same way. If you can drive a car, you should be able to vote without waiting 30, 60 days because we need to include people in the process. The reason uh, that our state is the way it is is because there's so many barriers to voting. The civil rights movement has been eroded in so many ways because legislators have got in, partisan or whatever, and rolled away, mainly Republicans, so let's be honest, have rolled away those rights because smaller elections favor them. There's more people who believe like I believe and believe like you believe than it is of them. But when you can cipher off 10% of the vote, every city that emergency management has been in, the vote has decreased by 15 or more percent. When you take away democracy from people, you decrease the voting numbers. And so we need to get people engaged. This is our time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bowman. I 100% unequivocally am opposed to gerrymandering. Actually, this particular seat that everyone up here is running for is running in a district that has been gerrymandered. Uh, this, This seat used to encompass Auburn Hills, City of Pontiac, and a portion of Rochester, and they gerrymandered it so that they could possibly work towards a future goal of making this a non-democratic seat. So we need to make sure that we're watching as well as praying so these things don't happen. Uh, And I agree with uh, Mr. Williams when he said that when you decrease or you suppress the vote, uh, apathy takes over. And so that's what has taken place. And what we have to do is make sure that we're energizing the vote and letting, restoring the faith in people so that they will come out and vote. Again, one of the things that's on the forefront of our agenda, and I was speaking with the state representative actually from uh, Flint two days ago, and we were talking about this and how that we could come together and try to make sure that we can create legislation that will end that, take the power away from the people that are there and give it to the people at large. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Carter. 
100% against gerrymandering because it's an economic situation that you have on that the S that they have for the 14th Congressional District that comprises from Pontiac all the way down river to Taylor segregates people. It segregates them economically. And what it does is it puts the other wealthier communities, and, and, and let's just be real clear here. It's about who have and who doesn't. And certain communities really would like to keep certain communities segregated, okay? And that's what gerrymandering does. Right now you have the voting strength in this S shape in the 14th Congressional District, and it doesn't allow us to be properly represented. When the majority of people in the legislature come from a particular party, then you don't have strength in votes anymore. I'm against gerrymandering because it, it, it disenfranchises our voters and it takes away from our economic base. It doesn't give us an opportunity to have a shot at a clear and concise shot at the pie. Thank you. Mr. DeMand. And so it sounds like it's the most uh, uh, concise and easy issue to get on board is the anti-gerrymandering. But it's the most important when you think about it in a way because it's siphoning the exact power that you have in a democracy. By gerrymandering, they're cutting out your voice. And they're giving the, you ever think about what Kermit just said? He's exactly right. Does anyone, did anyone come in here today and say that they don't care about their neighbor's children or their, their friends and their colleagues and their, and, their, uh, and their relatives? No. You come in here with that understanding that you want a better life for everyone around you so that when you reach out to shake someone's hand and they look you in the eye, you know you're getting that, real, that person's full attention. And they're not worried in the back of their mind about a bill or about uh, their child whose uh, health care bills are through the roof or something like that. So the gerrymandering is the very beginning of it. It's one of those issues that we need to start focusing on so we get away from, again, coming here in another two years or four years talking about very basic governmental functions that should be accomplished. It should absolutely be bipartisan and it should happen immediately. Gerrymandering should be gotten rid of. Thank you. This will be the last question. Thank God. What relative, <laughs> and, and we're gonna start with Mr. Payton. Let's keep going. Uh, what relevant experience do you have to help you become an effective state representative? Mr. Payton starts. I'm sorry, can you say that one, once more? What relevant experience do you have to help you become an effective state representative? Uh, the most relevant uh, is uh, I've been a pastor for 15 years. Uh, politics is about people uh, and making a difference in the lives of people, uh, ordinary people. Uh, and I've been working uh, very hard at that for the past 15 years. Uh, as far as uh, professional experience is concerned, uh, my work with the American Israel Public Affairs Committee uh, certainly stands out uh, as chief among uh, my experiences that, that give me the, the qualifications to be an effective state representative. Again, we were a bipartisan organization, uh, the third most powerful lobby organization in the country. I was the Midwest Regional Director um, based in, in Chicago, and I had 89 congressional districts that I was responsible for. Uh, and what that opportunity afforded me to do was to build relationships. That's a part of what being a state representative must be. We have to go in rooms and build relationships with people, sometimes people who look different from us, but be able to talk about issues that affect all of us and make certain that as we're communicating that we're making decisions that, again, will be for what's best for people. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Can you repeat the question? What relevant experience do you have to help you become an effective state representative? Well, I think that's um, a great question. I have been working uh, in the political realm for 15 years, but before then I started as a community uh, organizer for a little group called ACORN. And it took me all around the state uh, knocking on doors, asking people to support living wage, which is now uh, prevailing wage and other things that people are working on. I've sat in this, well, that seat for a year and the seats here for the last eight years. Uh, but everything that I've done, even working for a federally qualified health care center, has not only been about helping people, but being qualified to listen to people. I was born and blessed with big ears. And I hope to take that to the 29th district because what we need is responsive government. For a long time, people who have not uh, represented our interests have been making the decisions for the people who are there locally. And so being a city council person helps you get stopped at the gas station, even at funerals, people tell you about grass and trees. And if you have a heart to listen to the people, then you can really take their concerns with you when you're voting. And that's what I try to do. I try to listen with every vote that I've cast to be responsive to the people. Oh, it's time to stop, sorry. Mr. Bowman. 
For eight years, I represented District 2 on Pontiac City Council, and I made a lot of decisions based upon the citizens of District 2. Some may not have been as favorable for the entire city, but the citizens that elected me elected me to represent them first and foremost. Uh, as I actually worked on the Michigan Municipal League for a number of years, and we were dealing with other representatives across the state of Michigan, bipartisan most of the time because we came from diverse backgrounds. Working with the Lighthouse Board of the Lighthouse uh, Board of Oakland County, you encounter a lot of people, some not as privileged and some who are privileged from across the board because it's an Oakland County thing, not a Pontiac thing. And so you're assisting individuals there, uh, working with the National League of Cities and you're working with elected officials from across the country and working with them to make sure that uh, things are taken care of and not just their cities but yours as well, learning from one another. In other words, I've become a great negotiator a great beggar sometimes when I have to get what I need to get done for my citizens, and more than anything else, willing to work with everybody to make sure we need to get done, but again, fighting for what's right for the people. Thank you. Ms. Carter. Well, I spent the last eight years as on the Pontiac School District Board of Education and the last three years as its president. And we've seen unprecedented turnaround in Pontiac School District. In 2013, it was going to be dissolved. Now we're sending children to Japan and to the Special Olympics. Also, for the last four years, I've been on the executive track for the Michigan Association of School Boards. That represents all 600 school districts in the state of Michigan. And in 2016 and 17, I was the president of that board. On the national level, I was appointed to various policy and bylaws committee at the National School Board Association. And on the international level, I was appointed the ambassador to Kusatsu Shiga Prefecture, Japan, by Mayor Deirdre Waterman. Now, I speak Spanish, Japanese, and English. And with that, I'm able to communicate to various different languages, various different cultures, Republicans, Democrats, this, that, young, old, seniors, juniors, all of them. I have built incredible relationships, and I know I will be an asset to this community, this district, when I go to Lansing. Thank you. Mr. DeMann. So I only speak English, but uh, no, I'm just I got the Gozaima style. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my experience over the past 12 years since I first uh, got out of uh, undergrad was working directly with people, was working with the people after the policies and the negotiations were made, and uh, the the leadership positions that uh, that I haven't had yet. This is my first time, my first election. Um, so, it, I was in jar. I, I was the person that you came to see after those negotiations were done, when the laws were passed, when the policies were put in place. You came in, and you saw a person like me as your human resources coordinator, as an elections clerk, uh, working in the governor's office. I was the point of contact person that worked directly with people and saw what happened when you could be a thirty or forty year professional working for an organization, and then when you retire, and you're supposed to be reimbursed for your Medi Medicare supplemental insurance, and it's not being given to you on time, I, I've seen the effects of that. So my experience is working directly with the people who are affected, and knowing exactly how those deals get done, and wanting to change that process from the beginning, so it's more user friendly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Uh, so, you know, I've been sprinkling throughout this conversation what my experiences, my professional experiences have been, and, and I would stack those up against an, anyone here. Uh, an ability to see the entire forest, and not just the tree uh, that's in front of me or that I've been in front of it is an important thing. Uh, but aside from that, uh, when it comes to relevant experiences, you all decide what's the most relevant. Um, years of public service does not always equate to getting results. Let's make that clear. There are plenty of politicians that, or, or public servants that we elect and reelect that haven't necessarily got things accomplished. My background is in actually getting results from a small business perspective, from managing multi-million dollar budgets. If I don't do these things effectively, I don't have a job. If I don't do these things effectively uh, with regards to a business, other people don't have a job and they can't feed their families. Regardless of whether you've been uh, on a county commission for 20 years or city council for as long as you've been on, no matter what, the first year of training um, is going to happen at the state legislative level, no matter what. Thank sorry. You. <laughs> I'm looking at, at, at my closing remarks. I'm sorry. Thank you. All right, this is the end of the questions. We will have closing statements in reverse order. And Mr. Williams, you will go first. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're talking about results. Wait, wait, and what, wait. yeah, uh, it's last. Can I get my time over? Because they've been sure, starting me. So, are y'all ready for me to start? Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. All right, we're talking about uh, results and what we're trying to do when we go to Lansing together. We stood with the people of Flint, organizing buses, making that happen when they were in crisis. I stood with the seniors here in Pontiac. Every senior retiree had lost their health care in the city. We helped offer a $400 living stipend to make sure that they could meet the gap between uh, Medicaid and what they had to pay. We stood with our youth. We created a youth recreation millage that I co-authored that now allows up to $900,000 a year for the next nine years for Pontiac and other uh, kids to come in and have recreation for 21 and under to curb delinquency. We also saved the taxpayers of this municipality millions of dollars by standing up to Bloomfield Park and making sure that the, the, the developer instead of the city ended up paying those fees. And so it doesn't matter how long you've been in office, it's how well you've served. And at every level I served in, from licking stamps and envelopes to where I am right now, we've always served the people together. And if you give me your vote on August 7th, together we're going to make the 29th district the best district in the state of Michigan. Thank you and good night. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Payton. This is a very critical election. Uh, there are a number of uh, critically important matters, uh, complex issues that we have to address uh, that, is, that are relative not only to the city of Pontiac, but this 29th district. Obviously here in the city of Pontiac, we need to make certain that we're uh, ensuring that we have quality education for all of our young people. But in addition to that, more broad uh, throughout this district, we have to do more to support working families to ensure that we're developing uh, our workforce uh, by ensuring that there are opportunities uh, to provide training, uh, relevant training for individuals to get high paying jobs, uh, and we also have a mental illness uh, uh, issue here in the city of Pontiac. There are a number of issues, uh, not just in the city of Pontiac, but this 29th district. There are a number of very complex issues uh, that we have here in the, in the community, and we need to make certain that whoever we elect uh, going to Lansing, and hopefully it will be me, will be someone who understands the complex nature of the issues that we have and who's competent uh, enough to make the decisions that ultimately will be results driven and affect you every day in a positive manner. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Um, hopefully, and I, and I think we all agree that we're tired of politics as usual, and we're seeing it from a national level all the way down to a local level. It's why I've been stressing that we need new energy, why we need a fresh perspective, uh, why we need refreshing leadership, uh, because I'll go back to what a smart government ultimately is. It's innovation mixed with fiscal responsibility, and we have to have individuals representing us that not only understand what the need are for right now but people who understand what our future needs are where we aren't in the space where we are um, not thinking about our future or or for whatever reason because we can't relate or we don't understand what those young people's experiences are so I believe that I'm situated in a space where my accomplishment accomplishment speaks for themselves where I've gained the respect of my elders uh, but I also have an ability to relate and still inspire younger generations and that's going to be really important when we talk about the future of our governments. I, I drive on your roads. I understand your situation just like everyone up here. Thank you. Mr. DeMann. And I think the important part that we have to remember here is that what we've done over the past several years and then looking into the future is that we've decided to put basic issues that government is responsible at the forefront of an election and we're not doing what we should be doing which is making sure that the health and safety and well-being of ourselves our family our friends our colleagues and of course we have to make sure that we're, we're sorry um, we have to make sure that the 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 people that we're we're putting into office understand that 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 that's the most important thing to do is to uh, is to have um um excuse me um Give him some time for him. Yeah, please do. Yeah, he deserves it. Yeah. I'll start over. That was stop the clock. Yeah, because that was a distraction. Go ahead. Oh, right. Sorry, I'm, it's that's uh, a mistake. Mistakes happen. It's okay. But um, so uh, but any, so getting back to my our original point, which is that we have to make sure that we start holding our elected officials accountable for the basic functions that they're paid to do. That they're, they're not doing this for free at that level at the state legislature. legislature. So we have to make sure that we're electing people who are getting results. And if they come before you in two years, hopefully, again, you give me an opportunity on August 7th to continue through. I'm going to show you the sort of leadership that we do need, which is making sure that we're focused on what you all have to say and not what any special interest has to say. But 
if we have them come before us in two more years, if it's not me, then make sure that we're not looking at the same issues that we're talking about today. Write it down. We're talking about clean water. We're talking about roads and infrastructure. If they come back in two years saying that we need to worry about roads and infrastructure and water quality, then you can see what the problem is, that so much money is poured in to making sure we're distracted from the real issues, which is we're overworked, we're underpaid, we're, we're living in a society where we don't have universal health care, so people can go bankrupt because of health care. I've been there. I've worked at these uh, as a human resource coordinator, and I'm telling you, it's crippling. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Carter. Thank you. I can't stress enough that in 2013, Pontiac School District was slated to be wiped off the map. With that would have went to city. Any city that loses its school district loses its heart. I'm pleased to say right now, of the seven unions that we had at Pontiac School District, we still have all six. I'm also pleased to say that we have 450 workers still over Pontiac School District. We did not get all our workers cut off by the consent agreement consultant. When you look at the person that you want to be in this position, you look at the track record of what they've done. If they can't show you anything they've done but what they talk about and what they're going to do, you know, that should be your biggest indication. And you can look at what they're doing right now. That will also give you an indication of what they would do when they go to Lansing. When I go to Lansing, I'm going to fight for this city, this district, just like I fought for Pontiac School District. Right now, Pontiac School District is showing up and showing out, and I'm really proud of the work of Pontiac School District and everybody that's part of it. Thank you. Mr. Bowman. Leadership is everything. I tell my sons who are athletically inclined, coaching is everything. I've sat here behind this dais for eight years. I voted no on seven of the eight budgets that came before this city because I knew that the numbers were not correct. And when a forensic audit was done, based upon the resolution that I created, they showed by the wall group there was a mismanagement of funds, there was a uh, just short of illegalities that were taking place and they were stopped at the door and were not allowed to go forward further than there. The citizens in District 2 spoke and said that we are tired of the train blowing, but the city doesn't have money to stop it. So I went to Lansing and I met on the request of my students, of my uh, residents, I met with Gloria Jeff, the Director of Transportation for the State of Michigan at that time, along with the leaders of Canadian National Railroad and we created a quiet zone with no monies from the city. Proven. We went to the state of Michigan and got the DNR and the DEQ to come down because citizens were wanting to have a watershed board created. And they came down and met with those citizens, proven. We're fighters, we've been fighting, and we're gonna to continue to fight for the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. The League of Women Voters would like to thank the audience, the candidates, Pontiac TV, and Mayor Waterman for making this forum possible. For further nonpartisan information on these candidates, we have, the League has a voter guide where they have answered questions in its, uh, on a questionnaire. And that's posted on our website, lwvoa.org. When known, rebroadcast times of this forum will be on our website, and we're all gonna, also going to have a link from the Pontiac Cable TV to our website so you can watch it again or have people you know watch it again. Uh, just get on the link. Um, the League of Women Voters is funded by contributions from concerned businesses and citizens. Our membership is open, open to men and women over the age of 16. Remember to, vote on, uh, remember to vote on August 7th. Please remind your friends to vote. Take someone to vote. This election, the primary election, is the most important election. So please make sure that everyone you know votes. Democracy is not a spectator sport. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Are we, are we dismissed? Good job, my friend. Good job, man. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. See you again. All right. Chris? Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job, my man. I'm just giving you respect, my Oh, it's all good.